From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 113, recorded on July 21st, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at CuriosityStream dot com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Rackinello and joining me today I have two individuals joining me today. <laughs> the first is Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and Daniel. Why do you say hello Daniel? I haven't introduced him yet. Oh well okay, try it again. I tried to preempt you doing that, <laughs> but I was again. unsuccessful. <laughs> and Daniel Griffin. Hello. Vincent, (laughs) and Dixon, and everybody else. (laughs) So when I introduce you, you say hello. Then I introduce Daniel. He says hello. Then you can say hello to each other if you'd like. I don't really care. The older you get, the harder it is to remember all this. It is uh, (laughs) mid-July, towards the end of July, right? Here in New York City, it's summer. Yes. We have a gorgeous gorgeous day today, 31 Celsius. It's It's hot. A little up there, but the humidity is not so bad, I presume. Oh, you think that makes a difference? <clears throat> Much different. Much different. Okay. Oh, yeah. Big time. And so far, we don't have any Zika transmission within the continental Is that proven? Because we had one in Florida that's up for debate. Yeah, we don't know yet. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if there were a handful How about in Florida. The, dengue now and then does that as well. Oh, dengue certainly does. But, but what here about in New York City, nah. What about the transfer from the care handler to the... Let's say, let me ask Daniel this. Daniel, we know that Zika virus is in urine, and here we have a sick person in bed and a, and a handler. What procedure could allow infection via urine? Um. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> that, was, that was what. Well, you know, the interesting thing we know is, you know, so we sort of, I asked myself, well, you know, we know it's in the urine. We know it's in certain body fluids. Yeah, yeah. But also the other side is is how can it get in? Does it need to be directly injected or can it come in through a, a mucous membrane, let's yeah, say? I don't know. And I think or we know cut. from, or a cut. And I think yeah. we know from the sexual transmission it can come in through certain mucous yeah. membranes. Yeah. I don't know, you know, can it come in through the eye? Could it, you know, if some got splashed in the mouth or, yeah, it could be. you know, or, or just an open cut on the so, hand. So, you know, it, you know what kills me? People are puzzled by this. They're puzzled. I don't think it's a mystery at all. If you just think, and anyway, it's one out of tens of thousands. What's it's it's true. kind of really irrelevant yep. to begin with? <laughs> oh boy! But it makes news, you know. Dog bites man, no news. Man makes, bites dog. That's, that's true. News. <laughs> you know, in in general, the news is. I don't like it. The news is horrible. It's yeah, usually horrible. It panders horrible. to their fear index. Or it, the problem is it's profit driven and that makes it corrupted. Yeah. Just like journals, many journals are profit driven. Are they really? And it corrupts them as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. But we don't want to talk about corruption or anything like no. that. We want to talk about science here on TWIP. Right. And um, now we we have a, a previous case, but you had said someone's going to join us to talk about it. Yeah, is let me right? uh, let our listeners know. So we're gonna we're gonna present the case, but we have a. Columbia Infectious Disease Fellow, and he was the Infectious Disease Fellow who was primary on this case. He was the one who got the call, come and come and help us out. As he'll tell us, the uh, consult was actually, we got a guy, we think it's cancer, can you rule out infection? That was actually the, <laughs> <laughs> the consult. It's pretty brief. <laughs> and then later we'll uh, learn that All right, did so you want to start going through the guesses and wait for him <laughs> yeah. to get here? Sure. And so when he comes, we'll introduce him and we'll, we'll learn right. a little bit more right. about him. So remind us about the case. Sure. This is case from TWIP 112. Here at the Columbia University Medical Center, we had a 59-year-old male who came in with a past medical history significant for what he says, childhood polio, and he's coming in with worsening lower extremity weakness and bowel and bladder incontinence. So he's losing urine and stool involuntarily, and his legs are very weak. Two years before, um, he had had some worsening back pain and some weakness, and this had actually gotten to the point where he could not work. 
Um, he currently, he can't walk up even a single flight of stairs. This has been for the last several weeks, about a month. Um, and then one week prior to him coming in and being admitted, he was having fever, um, but no other symptoms really. No headaches, no diarrhea, no cough. We did learn that he splits his time between Washington Heights and um, Mexico, um, and that he um, had been doing construction work here in New York, but he had been doing agricultural work in a rural town in southern Mexico prior to this. Um, and he was doing this, you know, 10 months, two months back and forth with Mexico. I think that was for the last couple of years. Prior to that, he was from Mexico, living in Mexico. Um, in Mexico, he was working in a corn growing area. He um, has been exposed to bugs. Um, he has a son and a daughter and he visits them. They live here in the U.S. He lives with his wife, um, but she stays in Mexico and she's fine. He's HIV negative. Uh, as far as dietary history, he learned that he eats home prepared foods, no dietary restrictions. Um, on exam, no fever. His vital signs were normal, but what really struck us was a lot of weakness in his lower extremities, um, and it wasn't it wasn't completely symmetrical. One side was more weakness than the other. A um, little bit of um, decreased ability to feel things in the lower extremities, and so we were putting this together as it, it sounded you know, from a clinical point, like he may have a lesion in his spinal cord. Right. Like we talk about there being a level. Um, we had some lab works um, where lab work where his uh, glucose was elevated. There are markers of inflammation and those were slightly elevated. Um, his white count was normal. Um, he mildly anemic, um, no blood detected in the stool. And then we talked about some imaging tests. We had an MRI of the spine um, where the, the vertebrae, the bones looked fine, but at about the nine, nine, 10 thoracic level. So think about where your, um, your umbilicus or belly button is. And if you wrap around to the back, right in sort of the, um, maybe a few inches above there. So your lower back, your lower chest before you get down the abdomen, um, right about, we say T9, T10, there was inflammation of the spinal cord and it looked like there was a mass and some kind of a compromise of the canal. So it looks like something was pushing on this man's spinal cord. He did have hydrocephalus. Um, so that he did was, have, he did without have, symptoms though. Yeah, he had hydrocephalus, but he wasn't, wasn't reporting any symptoms. Um, Isn't that unusual? I mean, if you have hydrocephalus, I would, I always think of headaches. And you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it it's speaks to the chronicity. Um, if it was acute, then you would, you would almost always see, um, symptoms headache but if it's gradual if this is developing over time and actually it sounds by the history that this has been developing over and you months, accommodate you think? then you start to well you accommodate to some degree but you you don't tend to have the um the symptoms the headache but if it was acute yes you would almost certainly have a headache right. all right so we had a bunch of guesses lots of guesses we did very first one in from chris who writes dear twip turnian Turnion, T E R N I O N. Do you know what that means? I guess it means three people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good guess, Dixon. A company of three, a triad or set of three. There you go. Twip Turnion. What a great one. That's good. It's a humid 27C at the Morningside campus of Columbia University, uh -huh. and I am taking a quick break from the bench to write you. I was introduced to the Twix podcast family by a lab mate about six months ago and i have since worked through the entire backlog of twip nice. most of twim and have kept current with twiv and twivo now that i have run through the past episodes i think it's time that i take a guess at one of your case studied i work with pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilms and have been fortunate enough to not have any personal experience with parasites so it's a probable wow. that my guess will be off base but it can't hurt to try I always wondered if anyone here at Columbia listens to our stuff. Now you no. know. At one, least one person. One person. At least, no, no, two, because he was recommended by somebody else. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I believe the patient from TWIP 112 may be suffering from a case of CNS schistosomiasis brought on by schistosoma trematode. The usual suspects are S. hematobium, S. mansoni, and S. japonicum. Generally, Mexico isn't a country in which this condition is thought to be endemic, but Daniel seemed to make it very clear that this patient spent his 10-month stints in the southern portion of the country, which is quite close to other regions where it is more common, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, and PR, for example. 
Parasites eggs are introduced to fresh water through the feces and or urine of an infected person where they invade an intermediate snail host, as many trematodes do, and are later able to survive in a free-swimming larval state before encountering and penetrating the skin of a human host. Once inside, the worms sexually mature, pair up together, isn't that romantic, and settle down inside the blood vessels. Females lay eggs which travel throughout the body, most commonly ending up in the bladder, lungs, heart, digestive system, and sometimes CNS and brain. The WHO indicates that agricultural workers are part of a high-risk group that are regularly at risk for schistosomiasis. Anemia, urinary incontinence, and bowel issues are commonly associated with schistosomiasis, and they can either present with an acute onset or can be chronic in nature, taking years to be notable enough to raise serious concern. I suspect the numbness and severely reduced function in the legs is due to the spinal mass mentioned, which would be caused by the presence of schistosome ova, which are responsible for the pathology associated with these parasites, which can spur granuloma formation in that area. In fact, I found a publication from the CDC outlining cases of spine-brain-associated schistosomiasis in Peace Corps volunteers, which closely mirrors the symptoms described in the case study. It is worth noting that almost every other case I encountered in my PubMed search is also mentioned that standard blood screens also returned unremarkable results. Diagnosis is achieved by urinalysis and examination of stool for the characteristic <laughs> eggs, blood tests for presence of schistosome antigens, and biopsy of lesions to look for the presence of worms or eggs. Tricky part is there may not be evidence of the worms at one area at any given time. I would collect urine and stool samples for a few consecutive days, order blood tests to look for associated antigens, and if possible, obtain a biopsy of a spinal lesion in hopes of observing granulomas containing schistosomes and or their eggs. Treatment. Combination of prosequantil and corticosteroids. Since the prosequantil only kills the adults, it's necessary to continue to monitor the patient and probably readminister drug periodically to ensure that the successive generation is killed. I don't know what to do about the brain, but I would presume that it is best to tackle this active infection first and then reinvestigate with a neurosurgeon, perhaps. I'm unsure if treatment for the schistosomes will lead to a complete restoration of function and feeling in the legs, as it seems like the spinal mass would need to be removed or reduced in order to return to normal function. If my guess is wrong, I still got to spend an hour break from the bench absorbing a bunch of fascinating information about these parasites. Who would complain about that? There you go. Thank you for the amazing podcast. And Dr. Racaniello, I will see you in the spring of 2017. Well, I will have the pleasure of taking your virology course. Chris is in the Dietrich lab nice. in the biology department. Welcome. Have a seat. We have uh, Jason Zucker now joining us. Jason Zucker. Hey, Jason. So I'll give Jason Zucker a little bit of an intro. Jason Zucker, who's going to be joining us today, is one of the infectious disease fellows here at Columbia University Medical Center. He's actually a med ped, so he does um, adult and pediatric. Wow. And so he's going to be training with us for four years. <laughs> so he can do infectious disease consults in adults and children. And he was, I was telling the story to our listeners before, he was the one that got the call for, we've got a guy with a tumor, please rule out infection, which he was, he was not able to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, can we continue with our guesses? Is that okay? Sure. Why don't we continue reading? How much emails? time do you have? Whatever you need. All right. Really? Great. <laughs> All right. So Jason, is that the name, right? That's correct. Yeah. Where, where are you from originally? I'm from New Jersey originally. Where? Uh, Bergen County. So right over there. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Where? Uh, Wyckoff. Wyckoff. Mm -hmm. Wyckoff. Oh, there you go. Dixon Wyckoff. Because <laughs> I've got a cold. <laughs> I was born in Patterson. Oh, ah. there you go. And I grew up in Upper Saddle River. Oh, wonderful. Even, you know that. That's of course, right there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right. Jersey boys. Hey, there's oh, a play Jersey on Broadway. Boys. My dad was actually a doc in Jersey. He practiced all over uh, Bergen County, Passaic County as well. He was a surgeon. So did you want to read next? Should we give you uh You will yeah. allow such a thing to... You remember how to... We just had one guess of schistosomiasis. Okay. Okay? Right. Uh, that was from a, a lab guy down here at Columbia. Go ahead, Dixon. You're going to give me the tough ones. Wink writes, <laughs> we had a case in Atlanta of a man with cystocercosis in the spinal cord. That's my guess for this week's case. We had a brave neurosurgeon who operated successfully on the cord. Wink. All right. So, so Wink is an ID physician yes. in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. That's true. Who listens to our... He's an older guy. That is very true. He used to be a Navy uh, physician. Right. That was... You can do another one, Dixon, oh, since it was short. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to read at least one more. This one is from David. Dear Docs, after getting last week's diagnosis incorrect in Prince, although strongylodiasis was the next choice on my <laughs> list, I hope to have more luck on this week's guess. 
the 59 year old gentleman from Mexico and and area meant an area highly endemic in the disease that I'm about to guess seems to have contracted an unfortunate case of neurocysticercosis, perhaps contracted somewhere during his farming days in Mexico. Symptoms of the disease may not develop for years with this parasite, but when they do, they can have dire consequences. In this case, pork tapeworm larvae have traveled to the spinal column, and while it was there, the damage was done. The larvae blocked cerebrospinal fluid and pressing on the spinal cord, are major contributors to the man's symptoms, back pain, weakness, and loss of mobility due to the spinal cord damage, and hydrocephaly due to the problem in recycling CSF. The lesions in the T9, T10 vertebra via MRI help seal the diagnosis. Treatment of neurocysticercosis is tricky. Surgery may be perilous since the parasites are so close to sensitive nerves. Posiquantil is the most common drug used in treatment for neurocysticercosis, along with albendazole combined with corticosteroid to reduce inflammation. However, this will only kill the parasites. For complete removal, the surgery is required. Hopefully, the man made a full recovery. Thank you once more for the informative podcast. Sincerely, David. You having trouble reading, Dixon? A little bit, because it's farther away than my reading glasses allow me to see Uh, clearly, you see, so I have to... Accommodate. I also made it small print, just a passive <laughs> aggressive thing, print, just, just to make it a little more <laughs> difficult. To, yeah. and, and after reading the entire textbook between Daniel and myself, I'm all read out. All right, <laughs> Daniel, you next. Twip Trinity. This is Emmy writes. Twip Trinity. Trinity. Let's start with a stool sample. O and P. This won't give us any definitive answers, but can help form a clearer clinical picture with minimal invasiveness. I am particularly interested in any gravid proglottids or eggs of the tenia solium variety, 15% teniasis cysticercosis co-infection, and amoebic cysts. Sounds like you did a CBC, but I didn't read anything about eosinophils. I would also like a lumbar puncture, ideally some fluid from the mass lesion if that is imposed too great a morbidity threat. My guess is it would reveal cysticerci of tenia solium, with the patient probably picked up in Mexico. He would have to had to personally dine on undercooked pork containing cysticerci does not lead to cysticercosis. Rather, he likely acquired T. solium eggs fecally orally from unclean water or uncooked veggies. Treatment is albendazole, praziquantel, and dexamethasone for the inflammation that occurs during die-off. Hopefully this cocktail works, so surgery and excision are not necessary. If the patient is also hosting a mature tapeworm, it will be evacuated during administration of praziquantel. In Parasitic Diseases 5th Edition, Dixon says, all patients selected for treatment with anti-helminthic drugs should undergo a prior ophthalmologic exam in order to rule out intraocular cysts. So let's do that first. Look at that. Did he really say that? He says that. Yeah. That Dixon someone, guy. Someone said that. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Would you ever initiate a prophylactic anti-epileptic drug? Question mark. Additional possibilities. Other cestode infections seem unlikely due to epidemiology and presentation. Neurohydatidosis, cerebral sparganosis. Couldn't find a spinal case of CNS toxoplasmosis without severe immunosuppression, so that's not a likely candidate either. Cerebral amoebiasis is possible, but no dysentery was reported, and the onset tends to be much more abrupt. Thanks for the great podcast. A welcome break from my pre-med organic chemistry summer school. (laughs) Cheers, Emmy. So we're starting to get a little consensus here, aren't we? We are. We are. We're honing in on the true entity. Next guest is from Elise, who writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, how are you? After some torpor-inducing humidity earlier in the week, we seem to be in a patch of excellent weather in New York, sunny in 82F, 28C. I have an attempt at Diagnosis for the 59-year-old patient in TWIP 112, I believe he is suffering from spinal schistosomiasis. His symptoms are consistent with this particularly unpleasant form of schistosomiasis, especially the ones involving his progressive lower body weakness and incontinence. Schistosomiasis can manifest itself in many, many parts of the body, and while this is not extremely common, it can show up in the spinal cord where it can take a number of forms, among them granulomas. I believe the mass that was observed that the T9, T10 vertebrae could be one of these. It can also be difficult to diagnose this form of 
schistosomiasis because the disease can be asymptomatic or progresses slowly. And finding evidence of the parasite can be tricky. Rectal biopsies and stool examinations often don't reveal eggs. The best diagnostic tool is to perform a biopsy of the granuloma if one is spotted on an MRI. The patient's a good candidate for encountering schistosomiasis because of his frequent trips to Mexico and his time spent in rural environments. I had some difficulty with the differential. The patient's symptoms could indicate a number of neurological or spinal problems or multiple sclerosis. In addition, his primary symptoms resemble cauda equine syndrome, which actually might have been a more frightening diagnosis than spinal schistosomiasis. Caudal equine? Cauda equine. Do you guys know what that is? No, no idea. No so idea. that's the, the tail of the horse syndrome. And um, if you if you... <laughs> If you look at a spinal cord, spinal cord comes down as a, as a mass, mm. and then at the very end, like a like a horse's tail, it spreads out into all these um, separate nerves. And if you have pressure right sort of where the horse's tail, the cauda equina, is beginning, you develop what's called cauda equina syndrome, which this man really has. He has a lower extremity weakness, loss of bowel and bladder function, and basically a lesion. It, it isolates the lesion at this T9, T10 level mm. that we saw in imaging. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so he has the... All right. Tails horse, horse tail syndrome. So yeah, he learned something every day. Well, I'm not sure we can pin this diagnosis. Oh, on really? Duh. <laughs> hey, do you want to read on your? He said quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll read. Go ahead. This one. Um, he, he expanded the uh, the print size, so now I can read it without my reading glasses. Jeff writes, "Hello, Twip doctors. The weather here in South San Francisco is 55 F and." Overcast slash fog. Gee, what else is new? <laughs> I think it's that way every day. <laughs> quite strange for a late June day. Well, I don't know. Um, this is quite an interesting case. I would like to see an ONP, although I am not sure it will be informative to the case presented. I'm going to try my glasses anyway. Ah, even better. <clears throat> In any CNS infection, a cestud would be the most likely suspect. Neurocystis psychosis is pretty difficult to diagnose, and when suspected, I would order an MRI or a CT scan. This is definitely an atypical case with no headache or seizures, although there is hydrocephalus. But I'm going to venture a guess of neurocystosarcosis due to teneosolium. Treatment would be with albendazole, but I would wonder if the patient would need to be monitored closely and have anticonvulsive or steroids given concurrently to anti-helminth treatment. I would hypothesize that the muscle weakness is due to the inflammation of the spinal cord and may partially or fully resolve upon treatment. Love the show and the case studies as it gets me to think outside my scientific focus. Joella and Donnie write, Dear... Oh, this is a duo. This is a duo, into, okay. a duo. Dear Twipperati. Twipperati. We've never been called that before. <laughs> I appreciate the creative, what, addressments? <laughs> I think you should make a list. <laughs> it is storming this evening in eastern Connecticut. Not that comfortable at 20C due to the 97% humidity. We're a recently married couple writing in for the first time. She is an MPH grad now at Brown University for a PhD in epidemiology, and he is an infectious diseases fellow at UConn. Thanks to each of you for this excellent podcast. First guest comes from the wife who is a foodie and thought of corn smut, the Mexican delicacy often consumed with tortillas. What, what is this? What is this corn? Can you guys help me on the corn? No smut? idea. It's a fungal disease of corn. Oh, okay. The husband. I thought it was something I would avoid eating. The husband. Or seeing on television. <laughs> the husband recalls a case report of a CNS lesion caused by Utsalago Madis corn. Utsalago. 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 It's Utsalago. It's Ustilago. spelled wrong. Utsalago. Yeah. Utsalago. Oh. Yeah. What kind of a fungus Madis. is that? It's a fungus among us. Is it a perfect fungus or is it an imperfect that, fungus? <laughs> that patient was severely immunocompromised. Does it make ascospores? Or- also, it's not exactly a parasite. Maybe on TWIF this week in fungus. <laughs> we thought about it. but <laughs> um, Post-polio syndrome could explain the chronic slow decline in nerve function, but not his imaging. We wonder if this could have an immune dysregulation component precipitating his disease. Our guess is neurocystisarcosis oh. caused by larvae of Tenia solium. Latin America has the highest incidence of cystocercosis, which can cause a variety of problems in the brain. We suspect this patient has a malignant form with parasites in the subarachnoid space blocking CSF flow 
through his cerebral cisterns and or ventricles causing hydrocephalus. Tenia solium has also been reported to cause masses in the spinal cord, though this is supposed to be rare. We could look for increased levels of antibodies in the spinal fluid compared to blood. But with hydrocephalus, we worry a spinal tap could cause herniation and dramatically shorten our patient's lifespans. Never mind. <laughs> First thing to do is start corticosteroids to block inflammation, and second, an anti-epileptic to block seizures. Ultimately, we think it will take some neurosurgery to remove the spinal mass and place a ventricular shunt. Then we can treat with albendazole or praziquanto. That should do it, unless we're wildly inaccurate. <laughs> Joella and Donnie. All right, the next one is from Mike, who writes, Hi, guys. I've got it this time. <laughs> the man has neurocystic psychosis. Yoo-hoo! But when I told my wife that I had the answer, she said, Let me tell you the story about flying pigs. How they go higher and higher into the sky, <laughs> trying to get to pig heaven. But what they don't realize is that it's really cold up there, and they freeze to death and fall to earth like hailstones. And one of those hailstones hit the man when he was working in his cornfield, <laughs> penetrating his skull, plugging up one of his ventricles, and that's what caused his brain to swell. What can I say? My wife is always right, so I guess I'm going with poor sign hailstones. Mike, <laughs> Mike from Oregon. Then he wrote again, Hi, it's me again. My wife made me write that last letter, but we all know she was wrong. The hailstone didn't hit the man in the head. It hit him in the back because that's where the mask is seen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> okay, got to go, Mike. Very perceptive, very perceptive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. That was really good. That's very funny. Dixon. So you've got Yosef there. Uh, Losef. Yosef. 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 It's an I. Yosef. I'm sorry, Yosef. Yeah, yeah. Dear Twip. The thing is, we've had like 20 letters from him. And you don't remember Still, how to pronounce his name. Well, you know, every day is unique for an Alzheimer's patient. My <laughs> main guess for this case would be tenia solium. The extra parenchymal forms of neurocystic psychosis can develop within the ventricles, leading to the hydrocephalus, and within the spinal canal itself, which would lead to the symptoms that our patient is presenting with. The cysts forming in the spinal cord is exceedingly rare, 1% of cases, but are more common cysts are found within the subarachnoid space within the brain. The last hint of this diagnosis are the ring-enhancing lesions found within the MRI of the brain that Dr. Griffin probably tried to avoid saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> treatment will be complex and may include VP shunting to fix the hydrocephalus, surgery to remove the cysts within the spinal cord, albendazole and or praziquantel to kill off as many worms as possible, and steroids to reduce the inflammatory response to the cysts, which would cause further damage to neural or spinal tissue. Secondary diagnosis. Toxoplasmosis could also cause the neurologic symptoms and the spinal cord findings. However, the patient is HIV negative. Unless there is another source for an immune deficiency, this is unlikely. Schistosomiasis can rarely spread to the spinal cord and brain and cause a demyelinating syndrome that could present similarly. It is unlikely due to the area of from which this patient is from and the fact that I would ex expect more common symptoms along with his presentation. A kind of coccus may also cause these findings and can be found in Mexico, but I would expect either a mention of liver cysts, expectoration of salty mucus, or a mention of dogs. Non-parasitological diagnoses, <clears throat> primary neoplasms, such as glioblastoma multiforme, or ependymon ependymomas. Ependymomas. ependymomas, ependymomas, which would be on my list. Metastasis from a whole host of cancers, such as prostate, lung, and melanoma, like to spread to the brain and spinal cord. Sincerely. Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Yosef Alan. Davidov, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, medical student, class of 2018. <coughs> okay. All right. Yeah, we got two more. Daniel. Mark writes, dear Twip Triumvirate, my guess is that gentleman has neurocystosarcosis caused by the pork tapeworm. <laughs> Consistent with this diagnosis are the mass lesion at T910 and hydrocephalus. Also, he is from Latin America, where this parasitic disease is common. Most cases are asymptomatic and benign, according to CDC website. And if patient is symptomatic, it usually manifests as seizures. Treatment for this parasite is albendazole, 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, twice daily for 14 days after shunting CSF fluid, causing hydrocephalus. There are concerns inflammatory process could exacerbate symptoms by precipitating 
inflammatory reaction. So dexamethasone, six milligrams daily for 10 days, may be added to therapy, <laughs> spinal therapy, spinal lesion, and may require surgery. I was just worrying, you know, do we have to do that disclaimer like afterwards? Exactly. You know, we don't. And do could this. cause impotence and your hair to fall out, you know, yeah, when we start. Right. But no, thanks for Your interesting case. <laughs> Temp is 34 degrees C in Oklahoma, but heat index makes it feel more like 37 yeah. degree C exactly. plus. Mark. All right. Our last one is from Jamie who writes, greetings and best wishes from Caracas, Venezuela. After an unusually severe dry and prolonged El Nino event, we are going through a strong La Nina cycle with plenty of rain and milder temperatures. Again, congratulations for producing such a highly addictive, fascinating, and informative podcast. Your current clinical case is certainly a difficult challenge for any clinician. In a context other than a discussion on parasitism like TWIP, the first consideration of the differential diagnosis must include intramedullary tumors such as astrocytomas or ependymomas or else extramedullary tumors such as schwannomas, meningiomas, and neurofibroma, as well as other cysts, arachnoid, ependymal, or neuroenteric cysts, sarcoidosis, and infections such as abscesses. Most patients uh, end up undergoing a diagnostic bi biopsy procedure to confirm or rule out the possibility of a tumor. However, based on the epidemiological history of this patient, spinal intramedullary cysticercosis by tinea solium appears a good possibility. Intramedullary cysticercosis typically affects the thoracic cord with a few cases involving the cervical and the lumbar cord. Its course is often progressive, worsening from weeks to years. Inflammatory reaction against the dead parasite is associated with perilesional edema, which can damage medullar parenchyma and therefore worsen symptoms. The characteristics of the lesion on MRI may help to differentiate between a colloidal or viable and a degenerating sister sister. Cistercus. How do you say that? Sister circus. Sister circus. I was at that circus once. You know, one of the medical students that I had many years ago sister actually circus. drew that as a sister circus. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> With two sisters <laughs> doing on the trapeze backflips. Sister circus. <laughs> That's how we remember. A spinal tap often reveals increased CSF proteins, a lower normal glucose, moderate lymphocytic pleocytosis, and eosinophilia. Sister circle antibodies found in CSF, either by ELISA or in serum, by enzyme-linked immunoelectric transfer blood assay have good sensitivity and specificity in cysticercosis diagnosis. Current treatment includes an initial course of the antiparasitic drug albendazole for those patients highly suspected of intramedullary cysticercosis and whose clinical courses are stable or when the lesions considered surgically unreachable or multifocal. Moreover, albendazole is often used with corticosteroids preoperatively because the blood level could be synergistically increased by the latter. On the other hand, surgery is a procedure of choice only when diagnosis is in doubt. Preoperative adjunctive treatment with albendazole is thought to be helpful to consolidate the lesion and thus induce a clear plane of dissection during surgery. Albendazole is normally used postoperatively as a regular treatment for four to six weeks according to the idea that cysticercosis is a generalized disease with focal manifestation and additional undetected lesions cannot be ruled out completely. I hope the patient had a successful resolution of his condition without permanent sequelae. Wow, that's a good one. We had a lot, we have most of them going for neurocysticercosis, right? The rest for schistosis. That's a second Great. good guess, except for the geography. Yeah. All right. So, Jason, tell us a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yes, Jason. Is there anything left for Jason to say? <laughs> Uh, so you you were given this case to figure, and and uh, Daniel said we think it's a tumor. Mm -hmm. Make sure figure out if it's not, and that's a lot. What a lot of these people suggested as well. So what did you do? Well, that's a great starting point. You know, we we initially were starting with the thought that it could be a tumor, but then we were looking to rule out infectious etiologies. Mm. So obviously, the first thing we did was sort of review the MRI with the radiologist to see sort of what other yeah. things they were thinking of. You know, the top things on their list, if it sort of was. If it's not a tumor, what else could it be? Yep. And so the things, if it wasn't a tumor that they, they included was sort of uh, granulomatous diseases, so things like sarcoid, tuberculosis, yeah. other things that present like that. Um, we, we had asked them specifically initially about sort of a kinococcus, neurocystercosis, and some of those other things. And initially they were sort of less convinced because they didn't see any definitive cysts there, although there was sort of too much inflammation for them to really be able to make that decision. And that's sort of where we started. So then we sent off blood work to test for all of our sort of different theories while waiting for it to come back. 
Mm. Right. Now, Jason, one of the things I didn't share with our listeners okay. was the um, the head CT, mm-hmm. which I thought was quite impressive. You know, the MRI we looked at, right. you know, we saw some stuff, and up in the brain, nothing too exciting other than hydrocephalus. Right. But what what did the head CT show? So the head CT was a little interesting. Because that's primitive, right? MRI is the fancy test. Why Absolutely. would you get a head CT? <laughs> so interestingly, we didn't have the head CT initially. We initially had the MRI of the brain, the MRI of the spinal cord, and you won't necessarily see calcifications on an MRI. Right. So sort of we had no history of him having prior neurocystic Because of the hydrocephalus, they brought him to the operating room and actually did a VP shunt, which somebody had suggested. Um, And after that, they did a CT of his head to confirm placement of the VP shunt. (laughs) (laughs) And and then it's an ancillary finding. (laughs) That's right. Uh, They found multiple calcifications consistent with the history of old neurocystic Look at that. Look at that. And this was already, I think, three or four days into our, sort of our diagnostic workup before we, got, we were able to get our first head. And what was his mental status when he came in? So his mental status was fairly normal. Right. Um, he was appropriate. He was answering questions appropriately. Yeah. He had neurological deficits, but they were more motor and sensory than they were mental status. So all these calcifications wouldn't have shown up on a, on a, on a psychiatric no. in- investigation like... <laughs> How long have you felt this way? <laughs> That's know? correct. Yeah, he wasn't having any sort of brain symptoms. He was having all spinal cord symptoms. Isn't that a bit of a miracle considering how riddled his brain was with these calcifications? It's a little bit surprising. You know, versus <laughs> dystrocosis is the number one cause of seizures worldwide. Right. And so it's a little surprising he'd not had any history of seizures before, any history of other significant sure. headaches or anything like that. Exactly. But he hadn't. Did you do any um, investigations in the long limbs also to see if you could palpate any of these cysts anywhere else? Uh, we were not able to find anything on physical exam. Okay. Yeah, he didn't have anything obvious. And we did also have Opto come and look at him, and they didn't see anything either. How interesting. One of the uh, slides that I used to show the students uh, mm-hmm. all the time was a, an x-ray of a long bone. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was of the arm, and it was just peppered with calcified cysts. Just peppered. I mean, hundreds. And just to be unlucky enough not to see that, and here it is only in his brain. We don't think of this organism as a homing organism where it goes to a specific region. So why would you get that unequal distribution of parasites under that circumstance? And That's really hard to say. I, I don't yeah. know why. We, yeah. you know, we didn't yeah. x-ray his limbs to look, so it's possible he had some okay. deeper ones that we were unable to sort of palpate on exam. Got it. Um, but at the time, we were more focused on sort of the neurological deficits he was having and trying to reverse those as fast as possible. Right. But no, I think you're right, Dixon. I think we didn't used to appreciate how widespread right. the cystic circi are. Yeah. And if you did, uh, this gentleman, I think if you did like x-rays of his yeah. limbs, yeah, I think in your textbook, shall we say our textbook now? Our. There are <laughs> there are images the, the, where you see all these calcifications yeah, on right. you know the limb x-rays. Right. Because we used to, why does it always go to the brain? Because it, it goes everywhere. It just goes there, too. That's the one that usually causes the symptoms of seizure yeah, exactly. or something, right? Yeah. But he didn't have those. <laughs> Dixon, is this multiple infections or a single infection? Hard to say. That's another great question to ask, though. I think, mm-hmm. when was this acquired and how long has he had it? At least 10 years down the road for, for calcification after they mm-hmm. start. When they die, they calcify. So then, at that point, then you can say this might be a childhood disease that he caught maybe while he was growing up in Mexico. It's interesting, depending on where you see um, neurocystosarcosis or cystosarcosis infections in general, in um, Central America, in our hemisphere, you tend to see these multiple um, lesions when you see the brain you smell, where when you see these diseases in Asia, it's often a solitary lesion. And so I don't know if it's mm-hmm. genetics or ah. a species level distinction, but it seems to present somewhat differently. Yeah. Um, I mean, this guy, the fact that we're seeing what looks like a you know, fresh juvenile you know, cystic cirque in the spine, which we'll talk about pathology later, and all these calcifications, it makes me wonder if there haven't been repeated exposures. Um, right. But there is an immunity that develops, by the way, to the penetrating oncosphere from the egg as you swallow it in the, in the large, uh, small intestine. There's a very good set of antigens that have been identified there, and, yep. and they can be used to prevent infection in, in cattle, for mm-hmm. instance, in mm-hmm. pigs and in, in, uh, in cows. So was it the brain scan that nailed the diagnosis for you? So that sort of still didn't help with diagnosis. Of course, you know, you know, he's he's from Mexico, and as we yeah. know, you know, cystic cirrhosis is a sort of endemic in Mexico. So yeah. the fact that he had calcifications in his in his brain mm-hmm. sort of confirm put us on the track that we were maybe thinking about the right thing. But it certainly doesn't confirm it because okay. that's the you know one of the readers pointed out. You know, case series say that spinal neurocystic cases occurs in one to five percent of cases of neurocystic cirrhosis. So mm-hmm. even then, it's 
unusual. That's true. So it's still sort of very difficult to make that that okay. clinical call just based on having right. uh, brain lesions. So, so we sort of weren't done yet. In your young life, <laughs> I can say that to everybody in this room, uh, but spe specifically to you, mm -hmm. Jason, uh, have you ever seen this before? Not 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 a blockage, but mm -hmm. have you ever seen neurocysticercosis? Uh, so I've seen multiple cases of neurocysticercosis okay. in the brain. All right. Um, I had not previously seen a case of spinal neurocysticercosis. Right. And before. where were those patients from? Uh, most of them were from Latin America, okay. in various places in Latin mm -hmm. America. And where did, where did you see them? Um, I trained in Newark. Nice. So I train sort of right over there where we also have sort of a large population of people from Absolutely. around the world. Absolutely. And so we'd had many patients from different places who'd come in with sure. narcissistic psychosis. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And we got a letter from Venezuela. That's one of the hotbeds <laughs> of, of this. Of <laughs> In Caracas is... Yeah, we talked a, a little bit people. more, Jason, about what other things were on the differential, right? Because when this case was first seen, presented, you know, we didn't, we didn't know that it was going to be on this week in parasitism yet. <laughs> right. No, we know didn't. yet. <laughs> But you rose right yeah. to the top. <laughs> so, you, so you mentioned some of the granulomas. These Absolutely. Like tuberculosis, sarcoid, mm -hmm. cancer was what they thought mm -hmm. it was. We wanted to rule out. I think in Mexico they had told them, like, you have cancer, by yeah. the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so so right. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, right. But so what were, the, what were the other? Were there other parasites you were thinking about? Um, so schistosomiasis obviously was on there. Uh -huh. we, we talked about it. You know, he didn't fit the end, sort of the region. No. Um, for it. Uh, Kinococcus, we talked about as well. He did get an abdominal ultrasound that didn't show anything in the liver, which makes that sort of a little less likely. Right. Um, and then sort of sar we'd mentioned sarcoid and some of the other granulomatous diseases as well. Mm. Right. All right, so and the serology, when the test came back, did uh, you have a specific test for cysticercosis? So we did send off the cysticercosis antibody. <laughs> the problem is it's actually a send-out test. Yep. It came back, I believe, after... It came back about... 12 days or so later something of course. like that mm. so for it, them that's a stat right so it came back it came back much later yeah that's too on, bad yeah that's oh, it came back bad. on day 10 it looks like that's too bad so but it confirmed the diagnosis. It did. Yeah. Oh, well, that's all it that counts it supported it supported, <laughs> it, right. it supported the diagnosis right. now there was actually a biopsy mm-hmm Right? I don't know if you want to tell ah, us about that, because they're, they're always very excited to jump. Surgeons are always very excited to jump in and biopsy Absolutely. spinal cord lesions, right? <laughs> so so I think what you had to restrain them, but finally they agreed. <laughs> and so it was a what, little difficult convincing them, you know. <laughs> he obviously has a spinal cord lesion, and whenever you go into biopsy, that there's certainly the risk of sort of harming the patient further, so that was their big worry. Plus pressure on the spinal cord already. <laughs> right. So their big worry was sort of, could we make this diagnosis without that? And the issue we had is without being able to visualize a cyst on imaging, you know, the, the uh, cystercosis antibody was kind of less helpful once we had the CT demonstrating that he'd had neurocystercosis in the past. You know, the antibody could have been positive from that, and this could be something completely unrelated. You know, the fact that we were unable to really rule out a lot of different things, including malignancy without a biopsy, really led us to eventually push them to go forward with a biopsy. Sure. And after about 12 days, he went to the OR for laminectomy. And what, is a, what is a laminectomy for our listeners? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Having <laughs> almost volunteered <laughs> yes, for <so> one <laughs> in my life. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. the back. So you've got your you've got your spinal um, cord going down. We think of sort of these round blocks, right? But then they also have these wings, the lamina that come around and protect uh, the cord. Uh. And so the laminectomy is actually they're going to remove from posteriorly. They're going to remove one of those wings, and this is going to do a couple things. One, it's going to access to the lesion. Two, it's going to relieve the pressure on the mm -hmm. spinal cord. Right. And they, that that, was the hope. Uh, they cut it off <laughs> essentially with a saw. It's interesting. They use like a little grabber. It's like, a, and they basically piece, piece, because you have to be very careful. You're yeah. very sensitive regions. So they've opened it up and they use, it's like an alligator clip. And you just are going to take little bites mm. until you've removed it. You don't really want to be sawing yeah, yeah, yeah. so close to the, to the nerves. Got it. And then they did a biopsy and what did they find? So what they found when they went in there um, was they found a large arachnoid cyst at the T10 level that they were able to remove. Arachnoid. Hmm. that one stain demonstrated neurocystocercosis. So the pathology go. was able to clearly identify uh, the scolics and hooklets as neurocystocercosis. So the entire cyst could be removed cleanly? Uh, they believe so. It was separate from the cord, mm -hmm. right? Oh, nice. Very cool. That's good. And this was done in the pathology department here. Yeah, that's correct. I used to work on the floor below, above them. <laughs> Man, and I, I got a lot of calls from them. Like, Come on down and take a look at this yeah. one. I bet you haven't seen this before. <laughs> they were able to identify it for us, and we were actually able to look at it the next day and see it ourselves. Nice. Hmm. 
And then what did you do? Was you start treating him? I presume. So we did start treating him. Um, there was again concern that you know whenever you treat patients with cystic sclerosis, there's increased inflammation, and in a constrained space like the spinal cord, that was a big concern. So we actually started him on high dose steroids first. We waited mm -hmm. a couple of days before we started him on treatment, and then we started him on treatment with albendazole and praziquantel. And but the shunt was in. The pressure went down. The shunt was in. The pressure went down, and they actually ended up removing the shunt. Nice. Yeah, they actually placed an EVD as nice. opposed to a shunt and then removed it. And today, is he back <laughs> in Mexico working? Well, no, as an no, no, unfortunately, because of the delay, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the neurological stuff is irreversible. Right. Oh dear. So yeah, it's it's unfortunately not as you know positive a story as it could be. So go back in time for me just one more time and mm -hmm. tell me when he first perceived his. Semi paralysis. Right. So that's sort of one of the difficulties of the case is getting a clear history on that. You know, he was working construction until two years before he came to us. And then she stopped working in construction because he began to have low back pain and lower extremity weakness. Mm -hmm. It sort of seemed to progress over the two years before he came in. And about a month or so prior to his admission, it got so bad that he was unable to stand up and go to the bathroom and have problems like that. Right. So it sounds like it may have actually been slowly progressing over a very long period of time. That's. Very unusual. Do you think that's an unusual presentation? It's a very unusual presentation. I, I couldn't find I anything in the so literature too. that was similar to this sort of long progressive I would course. agree. I would have thought of a disc right away, mm -hmm. right? Or something to do with straining yourself right. and uh, some some event in his construction career mm -hmm. that said you're not going to be able to do this for much longer. And I think that's what he thought as well. It's a little hard to say whether or not he had some injury and that was sort of some of it. But when you really take his history, it does seem like it progressively yeah. worsened over the two years, yeah. which is sort of more than a little coincidental given what we found. Sure. So the... So, so he continues to have um, bowel and urinary incontinence? Uh, so it, he had the surgery. He has uh, still has bladder, in, uh, bladder difficulties mm -hmm. and it needs the Foley to go to the bathroom. He's got improved bowel function That's good. and some small amount of improved lower extremity weakness where he can sort of stand up with a walker and take some steps, but it's still pretty devastating neurological injury overall. Wow. But if you had not removed the, the cyst and treated him, what would have been the outcome eventually? Well, you know, it, it could only get so much question. worse from That's where he was exactly before. Right. So yeah. he was pretty severely devastated prior to this. This is a small amount of improvement. Yeah. I Excellent. think the good part is that we're giving him a chance for further recovery with physical therapy and everything that he's currently doing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of it is, you know, there was no other way to really make the final diagnosis. If it had been malignancy or it had been yeah. something else, yeah. we would have had to treat those items as well. But if, if, the, uh, if you had not treated him, would the cyst continue to grow? No, it's it. Yeah. We think it's done and there's another there are a whole bunch of other cestodes out there that have fancy names like multiceps multiceps and some other names that i'm blocking on right now it doesn't really matter some of these uh can cause a racemos form of lesion where it looks like a bunch of grapes frankly so mm -hmm. i was going to describe a case that was brought over from mount sinai about let's make it 20 years ago now um and the, the physician in charge was uh at that time connected with the New York Society for Tropical Medicine. So he was really attuned to the immigration patterns and the people's diseases that they were coming from. And he, he just had to run over and show this to me. So the, he called me up and asked me to wait for him. So I waited for him until like 7.30 at night. He brought over in a Petri dish. And here's the, you remember the movie Alien? Mm-hmm. Okay. Fondly. Now, <laughs> this probably gave rise to that movie because... Here's a patient that was admitted to Mount Sinai. That's where you got your degree, as I recall, with upper paralysis of the arms, all right, followed by middle paralysis. The arms were now free again. And then finally, lower extremity paralysis mm. within about three days. So, And with hydrocephaly associated with that. It was an acute onset disease. And they hadn't got a clue as to... Why is this thing moving around? It should be in one place. It's got to be a lesion. Well, they took an x-ray. I think in those days there weren't CTs and MRIs to rely on. So they see this something. They don't know what it is. They, of course, they call in the surgeon, and the nurses are all gathered around. And here's the operating field. It's this little zone on the back of this patient. And as they they didn't do a shunt, of course, because they, I guess, maybe didn't think to do a shunt, or it was an emergency, and they had to do it right now. He describes what happened next. As they entered the spinal column to relieve the pressure, out comes this racemos form of grape-linked things. And every nurse dropped whatever they were doing and ran out of the OR. They just <laughs> ran out. They go, ah! 
<laughs> and it was like watching this little monster come out of the chest of the guy after mm-hmm. they wake up, right? Mm-hmm. And But Peter, on the other hand, and if I could remember his last time, I would mention it, looks down and says, oh, my God, I know exactly what this is. He says, this is a racemose form of, of a larval tapeworm infection. <laughs> and he stayed and he waited. And, of course, the surgeons, I don't know what they could have done except to continue, uh, although they were pretty freaked out by this, he said. And he, he was there, uh, all gowned up and everything with his gloves and with forceps in hand. He picked this thing up, put it in a Petri dish, put some saline in it, and ran it over to me. And we photographed the hell out of that thing. I mean, we, I was fascinated, mm-hmm. fascinated. Yeah, and the patient sure. made a complete recovery, of course. You still have but those was, photographs, Dixon? I, uh, I gave them all to him. Uh-huh. He published on us. He was also the dean of students at the medical school. And if I could remember his last name, I would. You probably knew him. He was a really nice guy. And uh, <laughs> in addition to that, I mean, he was fascinated by this topic. And you can see why now, mm-hmm. because Neat. there's no tool like, basically. <laughs> yeah, cool. Anything else we should know about? Daniel? Well, I think one of our writers brought, uh, email writers, um, brought up the issue that this is not from uh, ingesting the tapeworm itself, mm-hmm. but from ingesting the right. eggs, right. right? So it's not eating raw pork, and that's the story we always like to tell about the Orthodox Jewish community getting this. Indeed. How could they get it? Indeed. It's because their uh, domestic staff right. is infected and then contaminates their food with the eggs from that's right. you know fecal. washing their hands fecal. well, fecal. Yeah. Um, and somebody else, I thought it was nice that they actually got the percent right. About 15% of people that have neurosister sarcosis have it in the GI tract. And we think some of them may be giving it to themselves. So they may be going ahead, getting the um, tapeworm, infecting their intestine. And then they may be then failing to wash their hands properly yeah, yeah. and infecting themselves and giving themselves this, uh, you know, outside right. the GI tract manifestation. Right. Um, let's see. So one of the big things, we talked about the cyst probably wouldn't grow, but it was the inflammation. Jason, right ahead, treating with steroids. And we worry about that. As these degenerate, the inflammation can get even worse. And so it's sort of this interesting issue that when we treat them, we're going to cause that. So do we do steroids? What's the timing of treatment and steroids? Um, And then the other thing, which was sort of an interesting, is the, the treatment. Which drugs do we use? It used to be albendazole. We talked about, oh, albendazole, great penetration. But now praziquantel combination therapy has come yeah, on the scene. Yeah, yeah. And I think, Jason, there were some recent studies. Yeah, there was two studies. One, well, really the same study, a phase two and a phase three trial that were published in 2014 and 2016, looking at sort of the benefits of albendazole alone, albendazole with praziquantel, and then sort of high-dose albendazole, because they found that when you put albendazole with praziquantel, you get higher levels. And what they found is that actually combination therapy led to statistically significant increased amounts of clearance in patients with more than one or, one or two cysts. So in patients with multiple cysts, there was a lot of evidence for using combination therapy. Yeah. Now, with that said, that's all brain parenchyma neurosystosarcosis. There really is no good study on sort of how to treat spinal exactly. neurosystosarcosis. Exactly. But theoretically, you would hope that a similar thing would apply in that you're sort of yeah. getting better, more societal killing with combination therapy. A lot of the literature emanates from Southern California. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that one did or not. So a lot of this was Cayetani Heredia down in Lima. This so is Lima, Peru. Yeah. Oh, is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so it's Dr. Garcia yeah. down there. Okay, was, okay. Because hmm. a lot of migrant workers in California Absolutely. come from Mexico, and they obviously uh, are quite used to this occurring, unfortunately. And, and the neat- incidence is going up. It isn't going down, so it's crazy out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another neat feature I thought about this case was the fact that the MRI was so unimpressive, but then oh. when you did the CT, you're like, whoa, what was going on there? And and that's one of sort of the pearls of neurocystosarcosis is you need both. You need MRI and yeah. you need CT. The CT shows you all the calcifications. The MRI is going to detect these, you know, extra parenchymal types of lesions. Sure. And- Some of these lesions, by the way, that are caused by larval tapeworms, not from tinea uh, sodium, rather, uh, they have a body inside of them called the calcareous body. They actually accumulate calcium. So even though there's no inflammation, you can actually see that on a CT mm. scan. You can see the calcium deposits inside the tapeworm. Uh, so that's almost pathognomonic for, for that um, entity. Very cool right. stuff. Neat. Thanks, Jason. My pleasure. Thank but you. Before we come let back. you but, yeah, <laughs> come back. Before we let you go, I, I wanted to ask you. You said you grew up in New Jersey. Where'd you go to college? Uh, Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon, <laughs> Pittsburgh, lovely place. What did you major in? Economics. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> I took American literature. <laughs> and then, of course, we wanted to go to medical school. What else? So, <laughs> sounds about right. 
<laughs> you uh, were going to be an ec- economist initially, or you weren't sure, or you always wanted to go to medical school? I kind of, in the back of my mind, always went to, wanted to go to medical school. I actually did economics while sort of completing all my pre-med requirements at the same time. Okay. Wow. And then you went to medical school at, in, in Newark. Yeah, said, I went right? to New Jersey Medical School. New Jersey Medical School, right? I've been there a few times to uh, give seminars a long time ago. It's like a fortress, right? <laughs> a little bit. It's, it's a wall older building. It. Yeah, it is. Wonderful place. Great. And now, uh, you're an infectious disease fellow here? That's is that correct. Right? So this is a residency, basically? or uh, So I did my residency in internal medicine and pediatrics also in Newark. Newark, okay. And I completed that and then came here to start a sort of med- MedPeds combined fellowship as well. And you're going to be here how long? So four years total. I've just finished year <laughs> one and a month. So th- almost three more years. Ah, and then what happens next? I have to get a job. Ah. That's the economics part of this. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> so uh, by job, would you be, uh, do you want to be at an academic medical I'd center? I'd probably want to do an ac- be in an academic medical yeah. center and do some research as well. So. All right. Very good. Wow. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thank you guys for having good me. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have a paper, Dixon yes, and we Daniel. Do. We do. So we will do that, and then we'll do some more email. But first, I would like to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. It is the world's first ad-free, nonfiction streaming service. Now, Dixon, do you know what a streaming service is? I do. That's is when it? you go trout fishing, yeah, and I know. you're doing <laughs> a job at the same time. <laughs> right. There you go. It's like there a guide. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trout fishing service. Yeah, it's founded by John Hendricks, who founded Discovery Communications, Discovery Channel. You know, they have a lot of nonfiction. I've been on that channel, actually. You have? I have. In fact, I uh, uh, still consult for monsters inside me. uh, uh, Do they have something to do with Discovery? Yeah, they're sponsored by the Discovery Channel. Really? You bet. So this is all nonfiction. 1,400 titles, 600 hours of content, 196 countries. You can watch it on the web or on Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, or Kindle, Apple TV. And what they have is a wide variety of science and technology content, nature, history, interviews, many more topics. They also have 4K content. Dixon, you know what 4K content is? I think it's like high definition stuff. It's really high. Yeah, really high definition. You can see everything. One of the largest 4K libraries on the internet. (laughs) It's better than an MRI. (laughs) Here's some examples of what they have. Stephen Hawking's universe. Have you seen that? I have, actually. I keep asking you, but because I know you're- Stephen Hawking is- I know you're a TV guy. Well, I like Stephen Hawking, actually. Remember I told you I once met his father? Because his father no, was a I, parasitologist. I, I, yeah, his father that's was right. a famous parasitologist. What? I don't know if Worked people realize Florida that. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, that's right. They have New- Next World with Michio Kaku, yeah. Future of Technology. They also have a bunch of uh, episodes on viruses. I mean, I've been meaning to search for parasites. I haven't done that yet. Life on Us, a series that explores the biodiversity of our bodies and microbirth. Links the way, a series that links the way babies are born with health later in life. With Curiosity Stream, you get real science shows, not reality TV science See shows, that. which you get all This is time. not about the Kardashians. No, it is not about the Kardashians. <laughs> Kardashian. I don't know why you'd want to watch. The Kardashians? Oh, weren't they from another planet on another show? <laughs> no, for why you would want to watch a particular family <laughs> doing the daily stuff is beyond uh, me. It's- Science mystery. is much more fascinating. Anyway, you can get monthly and annual plans. You can pay by the month. You can play by the year. Or look at look at Dixon. This starts at two ninety nine a That's month. That's an incredible two dollars and ninety nine cents. Just think of how many cups of coffee you buy pennies a day. You buy at least one cup a day. I know when you come in here. I bet it's three bucks. It's it's actually two something, and I give them the change. So you know, for one of those cups, yeah. you could have a subscription. And then you get all of their content. I know for that two ninety nine a month. You're right. It's just when you think about it that way, it's really amazing. So check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up, and you will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, completely free for the first sixty days. Wow. That's two months free of one of the largest four K libraries around. Go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe. At sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIP. Our paper is published in the Nature Journal Scientific Reports. They just proliferate these journals, don't they? They do, they do. It's called Transgenic Imeria Tenella as a Vaccine Vehicle Expressing TS, TGSAG1 Elicits Protective Immunity Against Toxoplasma Gondii Infections in Chicken and Mice. And this is out of China Agricultural University. 
which is in China, Dixon and Daniel. <laughs> That's strange. How about that? It's in Beijing. And uh, <coughs> first author is Xinming Tang, and the last author is Shun Suo, or So, or Suo. I don't know. Sorry. I meant to, to, to break it up. It was the one with the grant. Now, Dixon, <laughs> we have talked about Toxo a lot we have. on this show. Yes, we have. And we we all know that many people are infected with it. We do. 30% of the world's population? In some cases, even more than that. I didn't realize that it's in chickens, and, and particularly these, uh, what, free-range and organic chickens? Free-range. Tend to have, where they let them peck at the ground. They do. They get infected, mm -hmm. 100% infected. 100%. I didn't know this. Well, because cats... And yeah. chickens are kind of associated with each other. So a non-free-range chicken like a Purdue, it's in a, a building and they can't go outside. I guess cats don't get in there to uh, contaminate with that toxo, right? Correct. But if you let them... So this is really a concern. And they say this is a big source of human infection, I guess, when you handle the raw meat. Is that right? Uh, you'd have to eat it. No, not just handling. What you'd if have you, to you handle it. it and then put your fingers well, in it? Well, yes, that food. will do it. That's eating it. It is? <laughs> I would call that eating it. Wouldn't you? When you have to ingest it, it won't crawl okay. through your skin. Okay, no, but not not actually biting it and chewing it and swallowing it. I don't know any dishes that are that call for or semi cooked or raw chicken. Whereas a lot of meat dishes, other <laughs> yeah, than yeah, of chicken, course, I got it. So they're considered a good source of infection for human and other animals. So in this in this paper, they want to make a vaccine for chickens. Right. Why not just keep the chickens indoors? I guess some people want organic, free range chickens. Uh, right? There's a good reason for this. Tell me. That is, free-range chickens have to be fed less prepared food. Why they is that? They scrounge for themselves. Oh, they eat really? bugs <laughs> and worms and insects, and they clean up the environment, basically. So they have these chicken apartment houses, which they move from place to place in a pasture hmm. and allow them to clean up the area. And it actually, and they fertilize the ground. It's sort of an ecological built-in mechanism. Uh, in uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Michael Pollan writes a lot about this. There's a Virginia farmer that actually does that. And his grass grows greener, his cows grow bigger, and his chickens are robust. But, mm -hmm. here's the mm -hmm. but, but you're at risk. And you're putting the meat and the chickens at risk at the same time. Got so. it. Now, remind us, Dixon, <coughs> what form of the parasite do the cats excrete that the, the chickens o -O the oocyst that's right and it will be in the feces it will be contaminate the ground then the now chickens let's say the cat it. feces i love this part of this story because <laughs> you know i do i do it because i can go you right back to charles darwin on this one good cats are pretty fastidious in their defecation events not like dogs dogs will go anywhere cats <laughs> they go off in a secret little place and they dig a hole and they bury it mm -hmm. okay they bury it so who do you think redistributes the oocysts? The dogs? Earthworms. Earthworms? Really? And they re they can take from a single huh. spot and they can redistribute the eggs or wow. in terms of toxic caracanus yeah. or in terms of toxoplasma, the oocysts. And the, the whole pasture can become contaminated within a year. Even if the cats always use the same place to defecate, as long as they're defecating in the soil. And, and this has been studied. We know this for sure. Very much so. Very they much picked so. up earthworms and found toxoplasma. Well, no, they, they just look for the eggs, and they're yeah. always associated with either wormholes or they're so far away from the original site. That, by the way, birds' feet can do the same thing. Birds pecking on the ground. Yeah, so you're talking it, about free-range chickens. Interesting. Right, they yeah. can redistribute it as well. So, But they wouldn't probably be in the same position to do that because, like I said, cats are pretty secretive in terms of where they defecate. They don't want you to know everything about them. Hmm. Cats are like that. All cats are just uh, these domestic. No, I cats. think uh, most lions. key lions are yeah. like that. Really? Whereas dogs, they don't care. They don't care. Oh, they uh, just tell me where to go, and I'll go. If you want me to go on the corner of the street, sure, I'll do that. All right. But cats, no, 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 no. They're that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, they have a little secret. Always learn. Yeah, the something. earthworms are. I was looking at an article here. Peritonic yeah. hosts of Parat toxoplasmosis. Yeah, of right? course, they are. It's that wonderful term, peritonic. Yeah, they like that. Now, Dixon, they use a parasite that they say is related to toxo, which is called Imeria yeah, I'm very familiar. tenella. Tell us about Imeria. Well, that's also known as Frank Purdue disease. <laughs> really? Imeria tenella is another, it's a coccidian. It's it's related to uh, toxoplasma through yeah. epicomplexa. It creates a disease in adult and immature chickens, or pullets as they're called, uh, of a, a bleeding or hemorrhagic cloacal mm. disease. Wow. 
because birds have uh, the common opening for both the solids and and liquid wastes yeah, that they yeah. produce, and it's a major, major um, economic detractor of commercial poultry. This, now, this situations. is solely a chicken parasite, correct? I myriad. Well, it's birds. So the chickens get chickens. it from other chickens or birds, birds? Birds. Birds can fly in from all kinds of places. They can go into this building where yeah, the chickens are kept? They're, they're throwing out chicken food. The pigeons will take it, uh, sparrows, starlings. You name it. So it's very difficult on a free range. But Frank ranch. Purdue is not free range. Frank, we, these huge buildings that yeah, are they closed. Have, right? They have poultry f- factories. I've seen see. photos of them. No, I know. Acres no. of acres. And the animal chicken. rights people all complain. Are they about sealed this. off to the external environment? No, they're not. All they're right, not. The birds can get in. And the reason why they're not is because they want to call them free range. Do you know what the definition of a free range chicken no, is? What is it? It's a chicken that has the option. <laughs> we're going outside but you okay. know if you're a chicken and you're pretty smart haven't we sat here vincent and watched out the window and what have we saw we saw peregrine falcons yeah. we saw red tail hawks yep. we've yep. seen an eagle out over here that's right <clears throat> if you're a chicken mm-hmm. and there's a chicken hawk remember that comic series you little go henry in, and you the you chicken go hawks, right they don't like going outside much so that reason they, they crowd that. together so does does frank Purdue and other chicken producers do they vaccinate against uh, imeria do you remember what frank Purdue looked like yep he was bald he pulled out all of his hair worrying about imeria tonella this was a big 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 move on the drug companies to try to come up with a drug that would for which they would not become resistant they never succeeded there's no vaccine then there's no vaccine all right got it now the authors dixon try to suggest that um I Maria Tanella is not a problem for chickens, but guess what? If but it you, sounds it sounds like that's not accurate. Well, just just go online and type no, no, out I, I, Maria Tanella. I, I, you'll I, see I believe yourself. you, but I <laughs> it's got a fifty percent mortality rate among some. Well, in, in, in their chickens. in their challenge experiments, they say you can't tell if the chickens are sick, so we have to cut them open and look for. It depends on when they so were I, immunized. Okay, you know, well, an adult chicken might be, but a a young chick or a a, a, a they pullet, get sick. okay. It, you may very well find... Pull it. What's a pull it again? It's a, I believe it's a sterile male chicken. Pull it. Pull it. I love these names for animals. I might be wrong on that. I mean... Uh, I do know that like a baby out. turkey is a poult, right? Yeah. Or a they, they sterilize them so that they'll put all their energy into weight gain. Because it's a young hen. A young hen. The hen would be and a female, P, right? A that's poult, true. P-O-L-T, as in poultry. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> right? Look at this. No, that's where, no, that's where it came from. So. I like it. Just... Well, so what they do here... <laughs> I didn't know that either, by the way. <laughs> what they do here is they take I, Imeria tenella and they right. make it transgenic uh, for this surface antigen of toxo called TGSAG1, which right. they say is the one that you need for protection. So they put the gene for this into sporozoites, and they can grow up Imeria that are now producing this protein, which they can demonstrate. Not only that, it goes right to the same place that it did in uh, toxo. It's on the surface. It's on the surface, exactly. So that's they had to use a closely related toxoplasma or a oxidian yeah. in order to get this to work. Right. So it's not only present in the in the uh, Imeria by Western blot, by immunofluorescence, but it's yeah. on the cell surface. That's right. That's and right. they're stably producing this, yep. which they then use to immunize birds. Right. And those birds then make antibodies. Uh, against this protein. That's right. A- and they also make a cellular immune response. They do both. In the form of lymphocytes that secrete gamma interferon. That's right. And so I-, I was interested that they look for both antibodies and cell-mediated immunity because t- typically cell-mediated immunity is what you need for protection against parasitic infections, right? The protozoans. We're talking about protozoans. Yes. The, the answer is yes. Yeah. For protozoans, it's mostly a cellular-based immune response or a TH1 type response. Exactly. And in fact, they look at that <clears throat> by measure. Now, Daniel, this is. I had a question for you. They they say this antigen elicits a TH1 dominant immune response, which they assess by looking at the classes of IgG uh, that are produced. And right. I, I I often think that you look at cytokines that are produced to look at whether you have a Th1 or Th2 response. Now, it may be that certain IgG subtypes are typical of Th1, but why not look at the cytokines as well? Yeah, I, and I actually think the strength of say is they do look, like in figure two, where what they're doing is they're actually isolating cells. Mm. And, you know, I think that there's something to be said about there's a certain um, 
immunoglobulin profile that goes along yeah, with th1. Uh, th1 versus th2 but the real proof of the pudding is you find actually th1 um, memory t cells and these yeah. are t cells that yeah. have seen the antigen and now they're going to secrete interferon gamma a th1 signature cytokine when they see it again and they go ahead and they take these cells and they put them in basically on these little spots they're they look big in the photo, but they're like <laughs> half right. a centimeter in diameter. Looks they're more really like a small, acid, right? A <laughs> and then what they do is they expose them right. to the antigen. And if you've seen it before, if you have memory T cells of the TH1 type, they'll start pumping out the interferon gamma, yeah, and they're right. going to make brown spots on the discs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that, that I thought, made a lot more sense to me than trying to show certain antibodies. Yeah. But it's also nice, because a lot of times we get a vaccine, and we know that the way the vaccine is working is through a TH1, but we measure antibodies mm. as though that, well, but that's too? not really what we want to measure, right? Oh, when someone true. gets a, a you know, a lot of so. vaccines. Right. right. So but the real, I'm sorry, it's, just to interrupt. It's okay. but <laughs> forget all these laboratory tests. It's whether or not it protects the host yeah, against uh, the right. disease, right? So they, they immunize <laughs> chickens and they challenge them intramuscularly with toxoplasma gone dye. Right. The and wild they, type. The wild type. And they do two things. They first, a week later, they, they take apart the chickens and look at the sizes of their spleens because they say uh, there are rarely clinical symptoms of T. gondii infection in chickens. And the spleens are enlarged after infection uh, in the uh, control group, and they're not as enlarged in the uh, vaccinated group. But what I find is more interesting, they, they look at the survival. So these chickens die eventually. Within eight days, they die, and yeah. non-immunized chickens die, and the vaccinated ones die by 12 days. So you get a four-day <laughs> extension. Yeah, four-day window. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. This, this is where we're going. Not great. It's, it's not great, it's, right? You, did, you didn't like that? You wouldn't get a vaccine like that? I'm going to give you a pneumonia vaccine. It will not protect you from the vaccine, right. from pneumonia, but you get four extra days. You got time to write out your will. <laughs> four, what is four days worth to you? Right. Well, it depends on who I'm with. <laughs> so, Dixon... Um, what, what could you do to improve this? It's only one antigen. Maybe that's not enough, right? It's a long, hard row to hoe. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. There are multiple antigens, and these organisms, you know, it depends on the strain of the bird, and it depends on when they're vaccinated. There's so much work to be done. Couldn't they just take Toxo and inactivate it and inject it? Yeah, that? you'd think so. Well, they should try that first to make sure that you can totally prevent the infection before mm. you start looking for the right antigens as they did by the way with malaria in mice they used irradiated sporozoites to prove that you could have sterilizing immunity so i'm curious more than curious as to whether or not a natural infection could be cured with a drug is that enough to give protection against mm -hmm. the entire yeah. infection but now what about their target right i mean it seems to me you want to vaccinate what Maybe felines, maybe cats, maybe all. I mean, how, how how do you want to break this chain? Because this is everywhere. Is I it, think you just get rid of the cats. I think the answer is forget <laughs> free-range chickens. <laughs> you know, Or if you're going to have free-range chickens, do it in a vertical farm. Whoa. But then they're not free-range unless, what, are they well, going out on the patios? Depends on how big the they farm is. They get special is. patios. Yeah, they yeah, go no, out no, you could still arrange it. Yeah, but it the, birds, the birds would still come in. No, no but you could have it completely sealed off at this in this case, right? Okay. With windows and little lawn chairs for the... <laughs> you know, just in case they want to look out the window, but I can tell you. Is anybody uh, raising chickens in a multi-story facility? Sure. Who, yeah, where are they yeah. doing this? Japan. Uh, I've I've heard that they're doing it in certain places in Europe, okay, and uh, in places where land is at a premium, but they still want a high production rate. And certainly, they hatch chickens uh, like this, and they they make chicks available to people who have the farms that raise them from chicks to adults. Right, I think the idea of immunizing chickens is a good one because probably, as they Im imply, this represents a source of human infection. You're never going to immunize all the cats. You know, you, you're never going to stop the backyard infections that people get. But as long as they're one. raised outdoors, you, you've yeah. got birds to worry about and all kinds. It's a of good other one, things. but clearly this is and not foxes. enough. Don't this, forget foxes. This antigen is not enough, so they need to add more in. No, but it's a good exercise in using a slightly pathogenic organism to prevent a largely pathogenic yeah. organism. Yes, absolutely. So that that's good. I think I like it like that. Yep. But, All right. but you're right, four days is just... Well, that's and not the same enough. thing happened in mice. Well, the thing is, that's just four days, but they all died. 
if you know, you know, if half of them died, that would be good. But yeah, well, the not uh, enough. LD fifty <laughs> was LD one hundred. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that's an interesting concept. Um, there you go. It's also an interesting concept that you're going to take another microbe, give it an antigen from toxo, expose. I, I don't know. You know, are people going to be okay with that in chickens, in goats, and sheep, and if it's the a live idea, vaccine, yeah. I wouldn't be okay with it. I think uh, molecular vaccines are the way to go for it. But you'd still have to identify the epitopes that are required for complete protection first. Can you get complete protection? Yeah. And that's an unknown for chickens. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that one. But if they do, please write in. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Now, when chickens get toxo, do they get sick? They die. They die. Well, wait a minute now. How can people eat them if they die? What do you mean? No, no, you don't eat the dead chickens. <laughs> well, no, you do eat the not. dead chicken, of course. No, no, no. Well, we're saying that... <laughs> but I think they die from the imeria, but I don't think they die from toxo, right? Because they all have toxo, and they're all going to die eventually, but do they... No, they, do they... I've, I've I actually had... My knowledge of toxoplasma in birds was not as strong as it was in mammals, so I went mm -hmm. back and actually looked up some of these references, and it's it's lethal in birds, too. Well, the point of this paper is that chickens are a conduit of toxo to humans, so they must survive right. to get slaughtered right. and put right. on the table. Right. Right. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Kill your chickens while they're young. <laughs> or freeze them. <laughs> and it may be <laughs> or if you freeze like, them. Because most chickens are, are sacked at, at an early age, before, possibly before the toxo can kill them. They're up to, well, <laughs> the ones that are staggering, those are the ones That's that why we don't see sarcomas <laughs> in chickens, because we kill them before the sarcomas exactly. develop. Because all birds, all chickens are infected with the virus, the avian leukosis viruses that uh, yeah. eventually will cause a sarcoma, but we don't let the chickens live long enough I to happen. That. And that's the sarcoma virus that Rouse, of course, first identified. So when, when I, have you done any traveling in those for the Far East, uh, Daniel? I think you might. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. And I, I have actually two. And, you know, you go to places like Cambodia or Laos or Vietnam and, and you go to eat, right? And you're sitting at these outdoor restaurants and they're wonderful places to people watch. And, you know, you really get the flavor of, of living in a country just by watching people work. And you're, you look down at your feet and you've got a, a flock of chickens at your feet, basically. And then there's a cat that runs through and a couple of dogs. And mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a menagerie underneath your tables, basically looking for scraps of food yep. Yep. or um, just living their lives out. Of course. And then of course you want chicken. No problem. Here's one, right? Those are fresh. We thought, gee, this is convenient. You know, they're raising the animals right where you're going to eat them. But here are some really interesting health hazards about that. Basically, have you heard about a flock of seagulls? <laughs> I have, actually. <laughs> One of them was named Jonathan, as I recall. <laughs> Very good. No, I actually, I head to Thailand in the morning. Tomorrow morning, I'm you off to Bangkok. Do, you but I remember the wet markets in South China, right, where you go, yeah. and all the animals are in cages, and you point to, I'll That's have right. that chicken, That's and right. they take them in the back, or I'll have that snake. There We've used been, to be live chicken markets here in the Bronx. Actually, there's, I think there still, still are, are. No, there's around still this are. area, right? Yeah. Halal, Halal up in uh, the like 118th and 6th Avenue or 5th Avenue mm. has a big live chicken market as well. So, and you see these transport systems in Southeast Asia where there's a bicycle and there's about 200 chickens in the back in a cage and they're going off to market. Mm -hmm. Remember when they were looking at the H5N1? Uh, yeah, of course. They, they always look at these, they always sample these birds and first. Gee, yeah. Dixon, we need to make a synthetic meat substitute <laughs> that tastes good and is visually appealing. Oh, all of that? You want yeah, yeah, all of course. that? I mean, tofu is good, but yeah, that's asking a, <laughs> a lot, lot of protein in tofu, right? There yeah, a lot yeah. Of I I love. We had tofu for dinner last Tofu's night. Good. I like tofu. tofu it's quinoa. Wonderful. It was very good. <laughs> oh, quinoa. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Mr. Very, Atlas very over healthy, here. <laughs> very healthy dinner. My All right, goodness. <laughs> we have a, we have just a few emails, so we can get through them. Okay. First one is a leftover from last week's case. Uh, last not not last time, but the time before. It's from Emmy. Writes for case one eleven. Hello, Twipsters. My name is Emily, and I'm new to the podcast. I think she wrote a guest this time also. Mm -hmm. My credentials as a guesser are limited but relevant. I TA'd a university course on parasites and pestilence, and I'm headed to London next year for a master's in the control of infectious diseases. Let's see how I do. <laughs> uh, when I found out that the patient had minimal relevant contact and no recent travel, my mind shot to strongyloides, watery diarrhea, albeit mucosal, 
uh, and can recur many years following initial exposure, thanks to auto-infection. But we would expect to see bouts, whereas our patient suffers from continuous diarrhea, not strongyloides, not entamoeba, while amoebiasis can start with watery diarrhea and progress to bloody diarrhea, 10 days of continuous non-dysenteric diarrhea seems unlikely. Not Giardia either. Her diarrhea isn't fatty. This is the elderly Indian woman with a, a long history of diarrhea, right? Is that right, Daniel? I'm trying to remember. Which, what did she have? <laughs> what did she? TWIP 111. What is TWIP 111? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now. I'm going to remind you right now before I read another word. All right? Because I have if I can't remember, I bet some of our listeners yeah, can't remember. Well, you're remember. a busy just... guy. You got a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, this is a woman from Washington Heights. Wasn't she the one with the ra- was she the one with the rash with the thumb point purper rash? I think she was strong ladies. Yeah, she had yeah. ten days of watery diarrhea, but it's been ruled out. <laughs> well, not by us. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. Although, uh, while I'm at it, I'll rule out Trichuris trichiura and Trichinella spiralis. Sorry, Dixon. Trichuris generally occurs in chicken it, in children. <laughs> it would explain her loose stools throughout the night, but the sheer volume and duration of reported diarrhea make it an unlikely candidate. Trichinella can result in a few days of diarrhea, but the rest of the picture doesn't fit, particularly her lack of undercooked meat consumption. Although Cystoisospora belli results in watery diarrhea, it tends to be foul-smelling. The parasite is usually picked up during travel to tropical regions. Out. Our patient eats raw fruits. Berries. Raspberries have been a source of U.S. outbreaks of Cyclospora caetanensis, a fecal oral parasite infection, does result in watery diarrhea. I'd be surprised, though, if she were the only one in her home to contract it. Plus, the typical course of diarrhea is quite a bit longer than 10 days. Unlikely candidate. Capillaria filipensis is quite rare, unheard of in the U.S., and results from undercooked fish, of which there was no reported consumption. Still got to be thorough with the parasitic DDX. This brings us to cryptosporidium species. According to our friends at Medscape, temperature higher than 39 is not characteristic of cryptosporidiosis, so that fits. Did find a case report of one individual with hypoactive bowel sounds. Check. To quote from Dixon himself in Parasitic Diseases 5th Edition, quote, Cryptosporidius is self-limited, lasting from several days to one month, about the right length of time. When she contracted it and why the rash developed, I can't say. In practice, there's no real need to narrow it down. Can wait for the suggested tests to come back, but I'll tanker a guess. Crypto. It wasn't crypto, was it? That was strongyloides. Strongyloides. It was strongyloides. And what was, uh, yeah, what caught her there? So she ruled out strongly, oh, I, th- I think because of the, um, she wanted there to be bouts of diarrhea instead of continuous diarrhea, but no, this bouts. Bouts. <laughs> uh, Dan, you want to take the next Anthony one? writes, for whatever my opinion is worth, of course, you and Professor De Pommier have been great on TWIP, but the addition of Dr. Griffin has made the show even better yet. I now have to wonder what... Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle might have accomplished if he'd stuck with disease and not wandered off to fiction. That's true. There could have been a Conan Doyle <laughs> this week in disease. That's it. On a separate note, in one of the shows, you mentioned Benny Tadino's Pizza in Hoboken, though not by name. I was in the place once, maybe 25 years ago, and I pegged it as a tourist trap. If you've <laughs> ever the time and the spirit of adventure to go past the Disney version of Jersey City, at Noport, the local pizza joint that I went to is Gino's on Central Avenue near Charles Street. I've been a vegan for almost 20 years, but I still remember the phone number. I go <laughs> past regularly, and it's always busy, so I guess they still are good. When you added Dr. Griffin to TWIP, my thought was that you'd found a great angle, human health, to increase audience size and depth. For myself, I prepared for disappointment. My admittedly su- <laughs> superficial impression is that physicians are trained to practice and, like musicians and athletes, don't articulate well what it is that they do. With Dr. Griffin and his case thought puzzles clearly, I was very wrong. That's when I remembered that Arthur Conan Doyle was a physician. Dr. De Pommier's perspective is something very valuable. Even his mistakes can contain insight. <laughs> In one show, he confused. Profound ignorance. I like this. In one show, he confused monotremes with insectivores. How could I have? (laughs) Oh, my. And we keep him on the show. Since I heard that, I've been wondering why insectivores are called that. After all, they do eat a range of arthropods, earthworms, slugs, amphibians, and basically any animal small enough for them to kill. 
Thank you again for your great shows. No, those are, I, I like that comment. Those are the things like I joke about, like, you know, we, we sometimes, can you believe that? He, he didn't know what a monotreme was. You know? And everyone's like, does anyone know what a monotreme is? A diatreme? Yes, a monotreme, never. <laughs> all right, Alex writes, and I'll give this okay, to you, Alex Dixon. Writes. Oh, give me all the hard ones. Alex writes, I saw this frog applause comic by Teresa Burrett and thought of you. Thanks for the education and entertainment. Best regards to all at TWIP. Now let's just see what he... You have the picture there in your show notes? Yes. We're having a hot spell tomorrow. Expected highs of 33C. What about the picture, Dixon? Tell us about the picture. The picture picture shows William Walter Court. Wow. He was uh, America's premier parasitologist and trained almost an entire cadre of parasitologists that went forth and multiplied, as, as it were. What, and here he is. What does it say here? In it the, says, in 1928, first demonstrated the life cycle of schistosomes, a parasite flatworm that causes okay. swimmers. Did in. you know him? I did not. I there didn't have is. the privilege of knowing Here's him. Here's his photograph. I wasn't alive during the time that he practiced. All right. But I know that uh, Dr. Harold Brown studied with him uh, because Court, I believe he was at Johns Hopkins, but I could be wrong about that. We okay. could look at his biography and find right, that. Uh, I know he encountered him sometime in his life and talked fondly about him. Daniel. All right. Anthony writes, in a recent TWIP, Professor De Pommier noted that coprophagy can be due to some deficiency in the diet. This is certainly true. If memory serves me correctly, it can be demonstrated that in model animals, coprophagy results a predictable number of days after the removal of particular essential nutrients from the diet. More often in animal care, it's believed or assumed that coprophagy is induced by blood in the feces. It occurred to me that parasites using a fecal-oral route causing a bloody stool may provide the direct benefit of transforming their transportation from a slow train to an express. Are there any parasites that cause blood in the feces where this action is extra, by which I mean damage done beyond that to be expected from activity necessary for feeding and breeding, bloodletting, just to encourage coprophagy. I like that. What do you think, Dixon? Sounds like a topic for Anne Rice, <laughs> who writes a lot about vampires and guys everybody Tonight, It's that. a good idea, right? It is, but, you know, animal parasites, I mean, we're talking about dog whipworm, for instance, that would probably have some hemoglobin in mm-hmm. the stool of the dog mm-hmm. that might encourage other dogs to ingest but the eggs have to incubate in the soil for a week so that one wouldn't apply at all yeah Asperger's, right. same deal so you what think about, about uh, what about dysentery nobody's going to eat dysentery right no, no, it's, <laughs> no I, it's hard for me to um conjure up a parasite that would fit into this behavioral mode whose life cycle would be enhanced by coprophage yeah got it all right, now for our final act, <laughs> which have, is in the center ring, of course. Do we have another case, Daniel? Oh, I almost forgot that. We, we do <laughs> oh that my. right at the end of How every uh, show. We this? present a mystery case. I was ready to sign off and get people to contribute money to support our show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned, I'm about to take off to uh, Asia for, well, a couple weeks, a little longer than a couple weeks. Wow. Um, a couple, so, two, three. Well, so a couple weeks in... Bangkok, and then I'm down to a children's hospital outside of Siam so you, you, Reap, you, Angkor Wat. You, you, I know that hospital. You see patients, right? You work while That's you're what, there. Yeah, I, I do. I'll be seeing um, patients actually the whole time that I'm there. Are you a doctor without border? Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's got borders. He's got yes, limits. Yes, <laughs> I do have borders. I do have border issues. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, I, I like to. I'll be working with a lot of the local doctors. It should be should be, be a very nice positive cool. experience. Plus, and it you be, uh, you like the cuisine, right? I definitely like the cuisine. Thai food is absolutely. Unbelievable. Do you ever get sick? I used to get sick a lot when I was younger. I really don't get sick now when I travel. Which um, you know, part part I, is caution, part is. I was just in Japan for three weeks. I ate right. a lot of raw fish. Right. Is that a problem? <laughs> no, because it's all ocean fish. And we yeah, discussed this. Fish, yeah. They freeze it. They flash freeze it in liquid nitrogen. Okay. So the answer is no. Good. Okay. So here we go. We have a case for you guys. Uh, we have a 22-year-old woman who comes in to be seen in the clinic in the Bronx. This is I think about three years ago I saw this woman. 
And her report is one week of vaginal discharge and itching. She tells us that she's sexually active with her boyfriend. She reports that the discharge looks bad and is yellowish. She does also report some discomfort with urination. Uh, there's no strong odor reported. She otherwise feels well and reports her boyfriend is not having any symptoms. Okay, I'm going to give what you guys... What about the urine again? Sorry. Um, it's okay to urinate? She doesn't have pain on urination? She says there's some discomfort when she urinates. Some discomfort. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll give you guys a little more history. You guys, but all our listeners as well. Um, past medical history, she's healthy. Uh, no prior surgeries. She's not allergic to anything, no medicines or anything else. Family history, she has a mother with diabetes. Her father has high blood pressure. The only medica medication she takes is oral contraceptive pills. Uh, she's currently not employed. She lives with her mother and a couple sisters. Um, substance abuse, um, we ask about that, and there's, there's some on occasion, but no IV drug use. So there's marijuana, there's alcohol. Um, she's born and raised in the Bronx, and she's never traveled um, outside of the local area. Um, she does not have any pets. What does she How eat? Long is, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go, go, go. <laughs> How long has she felt like this again? Ten days. One just, week. One week of just that. Just ten days. Yeah, just just a week. A week. A seven day week. And did this? Did this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Did this? Did this follow uh, sexual activity, or there's no correlation? Well, she she does have sexual yeah. activity with her boyfriend, and about a week ago. Um, she just noticed that, hey, I'm having discharge. The discharge is continued. Um, so it was after having is sex, it even, but it wasn't, you know, just like right after anything. Like that. Right. I presume that they're monogamous, but that's a bad presumption on my part. It's like, terrible. Presumption. She might be, but is he? Do, is it unprotected sex that they have or? You know, it, or she's on uh, a contraceptive. She's, on, she's Sorry. on oral contraceptive pills. So that's, she is not, um, she's not using barrier contraception with her boyfriend. So there's not condom use. The, what did you say about monogamy? You see, I asked. Fool, fooling with anyone else. So uh, yeah, have they got, are they the sole sexual partners for themselves? Well, she reports that he's her only partner, but you know. Yeah, okay. Has he been interviewed at all? Um, <laughs> <laughs> because with sexual transmission diseases, if you were thinking of that, then you interview both partners. Yeah. Yeah. So he was actually in the room. It was a little awkward. He was, ah. shall I say, hypersexual, and uh, yes, hypersexual. Hi what does that mean? Um, yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, like so we we're gonna examine her, and he like you know once is like getting turned on. During, oh my oh dear. gosh! Uh, and it was very awkward. Jeez. But <laughs> not good. I, I consider that hypersexual. You, Not good. You, you but um, there was a nurse in the room. I presume. Well, we yeah you know and um, nurse practitioner. There was you know adequate not, supervision, not, but he had to. We had to ask him to step out because it yeah. was a little inappropriate. Sure. Why was he allowed, so I'm, I'm allowed in there to begin with? Well, he came in with his girlfriend. He was very concerned would you about her. Outside while we no, yeah, but we, the interview is okay. It's yeah. just the procedure you don't want exactly people. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly right. Totally so right. no, but we had to ask him to step out. So there's some concern that maybe you know. Yeah. Physical intimacy with his girlfriend is not satisfying all his needs. But he's okay. He has no symptoms. He doesn't right? say he's got any problems. Yeah. Right. And uh, does she have any fever? She has no fever. <laughs> any loss of appetite? No. No rashes? No rashes. Okay. And, and what did you see on physical examination? So you're ready for the exam. You don't want to ask any more questions. No. I didn't. <laughs> there was a question about diet. I think you started asking yeah. about diet. What does she eat? Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of fast food doesn't sound like the healthiest diet. Okay. Um, Does she drink a lot? Uh, alcohol? Well, so there is alcohol and marijuana use. Alcohol and marijuana use. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give Dixon the the exam. I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I want a nurse in this room. <laughs> okay. okay. So um, she is a slightly heavy young woman who. Um, has a completely, I'll say, completely normal exam until we get down to the vaginal exam. And the vaginal exam, um, she has vaginal discharge, and it's a thick discharge. Um, so instead of like a normal clear watery discharge that you'd expect, um, it's thick. There's a slight yellow, light green color. Um, there's no strong odor. Um, 
there is some some redness, some irritation to the um, the vaginal walls, um, but we're not seeing. As they, I'll say, you know, I actually do a speculum exam. We're not seeing um, any changes to the cervix okay. or anything like that. Um, but we are seeing this light green, yellow, thick um, discharge. And I will say, certain testing is then then You're staying done. away for three weeks before we find out what this is. <laughs> It's not fair. <laughs> and now, is there anything that she can recall that was different a week ago that she did differently in any way? No, no. Hmm. She didn't go anywhere. You said she never traveled. Yeah, right? no travel um, outside just the local area. Now, she sleeps in a bed at home, right? The same bed all the time? Uh, yes. And um, she doesn't share this bed with any other members of her family, right? No, she actually has her own bed. Um I believe she shares a room with one of her sisters, um, but everyone else in the family is okay, right? No, no other people in the family reporting problems. Wow, it's a puzzle, huh, Dixon? Not really. No, <laughs> no. This is you have you have ideas. You got it, you're straightforward. I only have one idea. No okay. ideas. Just a single idea. One idea. In yeah, it's too bad that I've. Well, that's okay. It's bad you have to wait three weeks. I'm sort of a flyer in this group, but... <laughs> what does that mean, you're a flyer? That as I have too much knowledge that's accumulated <laughs> over many, many, many years. <laughs> wait a minute. It leads me first to of all, one conclusion. First of all, we started this because you have a lot of knowledge. Yeah, I realize that. And secondly, <laughs> you can never have too much knowledge. No, you can't. No, you can't. So if you ask me for my differential diagnosis the moment he started his... You got it, huh? ...discourse, well, I... Don't know too many other possible. Well, what I'll what I'll ask our listeners to do yep. is, um, you know, th this is this week in parasitism, right? <laughs> but you know, as we mentioned with the last case, when the when the patients show up to me, they don't say, "Oh, Doctor Griffin, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's I right. came here with a parasite." Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so, so I want our listeners to think about what yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. could the presentation be? Exactly. Um, how do we think about this? What's you know, give us a differential sure, of sure, the possibilities. Sure. And then um, what's the next step? What would you do? And would you say, oh, it's this and I'll confirm it this way? Or are you going to want to make sure there aren't multiple things going on? Remember, as we said, you know, Occam didn't, didn't yeah. live in the Bronx in 2016. No, no he didn't. No. Um, and so there could be, a, could be multiple things going no on here. So about, people to no, no, that's think a, it I, through. I, I, do, uh, one more. So uh, menstrual cycle, where, where are we? Is, is, are we... So fortunately, we're outside of the bleeding zone. Okay, so, so she has not bled. Yeah. Okay. So we're about two weeks um, from her last menstrual period. You know, and it's interesting. A lot of these clinics, um, uh, women are sort of aware of when's the time to go and not to go to the clinic because of the confounding. You know, on the other side, someone has a problem and they come and see you. So, sure. And she has a problem. She's concerned about it. So she's showing up. Great. All right. That's it. That will do it, Dixon. This is uh, number 113. And Did Daniel. you know that? And Daniel. I like to bug you. <laughs> Please. You always direct these <laughs> comments towards me. you got another guy over I here. Because I want to wake you up. You're not waking me up. <laughs> there you go. I'll sleep all the way through this. He doesn't need bugging. You do. I don't. I need debugging. <laughs> you can find TWIP at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And please consider becoming a patron of TWIP and donating to us and the Microbe TV family of shows. You can go over to patreon.com slash microbe TV, contribute as little as a buck a month, even less than Curiosity buck Stream. You can even get a cup of coffee for a buck a month. A buck a month, 12 bucks a year, that'll really help if all our thousands of listeners uh, would help out. And that, that allows us to travel. I could take Dixon or Daniel with me on the road. <laughs> we could do trip on the road. It would be so much fun. Right now we can't because we don't have uh, funds, but... If you wanted to have a TWIP in your hometown, we could do it. So contribute. You can also, if you don't want to subscribe, which is what you do at Patreon, you know, you give a dollar for uh, a mo every month for as long as you want to do that. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And uh, we have ways to use PayPal or your credit card if you want to give us a little bit of money. And as I said, this doesn't go into our pockets. It goes into the podcast and allows us to do different things. So please check that out and send us your questions and comments. Of course, send your guesses for the case to TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Pleasure as always. Have a great trip. Oh, thank you. 
Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and medicalecology.com. And of course, at verticalfarm.com. He is the father <laughs> of the vertical farm. It's a parthenogenetic farm. Thank, thank <laughs> you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Always a pleasure. Hey, Daniel, have a great trip. Oh, thank you. Take a lot of pictures. I will. Are you going anywhere, Dixon? Uh, September. You're going to where? France. 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 Uh, que faites-vous? Uh, I go to Paris. Que faites-vous uh, en France? I go to Le You're going to talk about vertical farming? No, it's a, it's a I'm going to talk about the, the economics of vertical farming. All right. I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. Please check out his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.